Good morning, everybody. Uh, my name is Steve Griffin, and I'll uh, be sort of facilitating this webinar uh, for the next 90 minutes or so. Um, so welcome from Assurity. Um, our title of the webinar is Setting Up for RFP Success with Business Analysis. So our presenters today are um, Yvonne Bishop, who is a principal consultant um, and based here in Wellington. I, I won't insult your intelligence by reading the slide to you, um, but I will just point out that um, Yvonne has a great deal of experience. She loves to, um, as, she, as she keeps telling me, um, to be able to analyze and improve business. Uh, and that's what, uh, that's what gets her excited. So um, welcome to Yvonne. And then Amanda, Amanda, also a, a principal consultant who is based in Christchurch. Um, Amanda, again, has been in the BA business for, well, you're only 30, aren't you, Amanda? So it can't be that long, <laughs> all right? Um, but has been in the BA business for a long time. Um, she's um, a very, very good trainer as well. And we'll have a little bit of a plug at the end of the session, um, but great in front of people and just loves passing on her knowledge and her experience. And, I think without further ado, over to yourself, Yvonne. Thanks, Steve. Uh, kia ora, good morning, and thanks for joining us. Um, Amanda and I have, um, as Steve said, been working in this profession for quite some time, and we've had experience working on both sides of the, of the market engagement process. So both from organisations going out to market and looking for uh, information or uh, responses, solutions, um, as well as being on the vendor side of things where we've uh, been responding to different requests to the market. Um, what we know is as more and more organisations move into uh, cloud-based software solutions, um, having really good vendor partners uh, is a, uh, really good vendors are, are coming in kind of hot demand. Um, the things that we've seen uh, that can that can really um, create confusion in that process, whether it's just going out to get a, a market engagement through just sounding out the market or through a full-blown proposal process, uh, is generally ambiguity and, and a lack of clarification around the things that matter. Um, you'll all, I'm sure, be aware that market engagement is an expensive exercise and it's expensive for all parties, for, for both the agency going out and the um, vendor agencies that might be responding. These things take quite a bit of time, effort and energy and um, it's, it's useful to set some really good context for the context that you're going to market for um, and this will become a little bit clearer shortly. Uh, so today we're going to talk through a couple of different areas, but we're really going to focus on some areas that we believe are often underinvested in the lead up to or the activity required beyond market engagement. Um, a focus in these areas before entering the market uh, will we'll support a more successful outcome. It'll give greater context that matters, uh, give greater clarity of expectations, um, reduce business stakeholder and vendor assumptions. Uh, we'll talk a little bit more about assumptions and in fact, we'll talk about assumptions and uh, some of the ways to, to uh, reduce those uh, as we go through this. Um, overtly agreeing your business priorities is something that um, there's always room for improvement. So we think we've got some uh, ideas for you there. Um, and then enabling greater people participation. Um, so recognising that when we engage the market, whether it's for sounding or for just input or whether it's for uh, looking to, for a solution or to purchase something, um, it's people who are involved in this. So actually uh, creating something that more people can relate to. So uh, Amanda here. So what do we mean by clarifying your business context? It's you know something that uh, we're referring to as the work that needs to be done by the business before going out to market. And often that's uh, either done not very well or just done very at speed so things are missed so the timing of going out to market is important and I and there are many different reasons for when but one of the key considerations should be that you know you are clear on your business context and you're able to communicate this so some of the areas that Yvonne are going to talk about is you know knowing and communicating the direction of your business being prepared for not only going out to market, but for the next steps after that, because they come very quickly once you've made your decision. And um, myth busting, 
ensure that your business stakeholders understand the reality of what is needed and know what matters most to your business. And, and structuring your market request to create that clarity and ease of respond for sorry, ease for respondents and make it easier for your business stakeholders to assess and compare the responses. So a common mistake that we see often is going to market really underprepared with insufficient context or worse, too much information that causes a lot of confusion. And this is, this can prove really costly in the long run. So understanding your outcome, what you need next and why. Um, often the trigger for going to market, particularly if you're going to market for a solution and you're looking at uh, a software solution, uh, um, something that allows you to kind of digitize and get some um, automation and or efficiency in your business, often the thing that kind of triggers that is uh, a, a burning platform. You've got existing services, they're running on technology that's old and expensive to maintain. Um, and actually, it's not usually one burning platform, it's usually many. Um, it's particularly larger organisations or organisations that have um, that have grown over time and and done some interesting things to be uh, more efficient in the moment, like extending technology to do things it's probably not really built to do, um, or having to um, use multiple different uh, t uh, capability to get an outcome. So so over time these things become um, expensive, hard to change. Uh, and really do create quite a roadblock. But as I said, it's generally not one, it's, it's generally multiple. The challenge is not so much um, the, the, you know, this might instigate the go-to-market for either information or, or for a solution option. Uh, the challenge with that is that's kind of where you're running away from. Um, and getting really clear on where you're going to is, is much more relevant. Um, every organisation has its legacy of skeletons and systems and all the rest of it. Um, but actually getting really clear on where you're going and why um, is, a, you know, these, these things are pretty obvious. But as I said, we're going to share with you some things that we think create even greater clarity for where you're going and why. Um, and setting that context within the context of what you're going to market for, not setting that context uh, for your whole business. Um, so when we're talking about business direction and engaging the market, um, the kind of things we're talking about in terms of direction is, is this wholesale transformation uh, or is it a, 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 a lift and shift? So there's no opportunity to interrupt any services and, and there's kind of a need to maintain that very current state um, for, for, for whatever risk mitigation reasons. Or is it a transition to new capability um, that gives you a small shift, a small forward, and then that kind of continual um, iteration from there. This can be a really costly thing to not set up from the beginning. And without naming any names, I can, I'll give you an example of uh, some work I was involved in. So the decision by the organisation was to do wholesale transformation and put in place uh, a new capability that was, um, you know, uh, software as a service, new digital capability to allow the business to leverage um, kind of a core and common use and reuse. So rather than having these three completely disparate technical environments to manage uh, for things that were at a kind of at least a level three of process, they were the, the, the same thing, um, actually stepping onto one platform and, and consolidating the kind of investment maintenance overhead. Uh, the challenge is that um, the, the setting the future direction was uh, from, a, from a kind of a business outcome, uh, wanting to have more um, efficiency and more room to move and more room to take advantage of, of new tech. Um, that was all reasonably well communicated. Um, the, the, the devil was in a middle layer of detail. So the, the RFP completed, a great vendor came on board. They came on board with all of their uh, config and dev teams ready to go. And instead of kind of uh, having a clear future direction of this is the capability we want to build out and, and why it needs to build out like this, um, the vendor had some pressure to, to show progress quickly. And so um, rather than kind of uh, building what was probably a little bit more conceptual, um, they grabbed as, as you know, I guess, human behavior, they, they grabbed one of the product service areas uh, and I started working directly with some of the subject matter experts in that space um, and built out that product service area. Uh, unfortunately, by doing that, yes, there was a demonstration of progress, but unfortunately they hadn't appreciated that um, uh, a part of that 
that process for delivering that product service uh, was actually a very critical core common and reusable piece. And what needed to happen is that needed to be built independently so that every single product service that transitioned onto that new platform and environment could actually um, integrate and use this core and common piece. Uh, so instead of it being built as a standalone core and common reusable piece, it was built as part of the um, kind of end-to-end -end product service. Um, that created quite a headache for, for the rest of the transitioning product service areas and resulted in having to unpack some of the original build to, to, to make that uh, kind of realisation available. Um, as I said, that's kind of a middle layer of detail that um, was, was lost in the clarity of communication. Uh, and there are some things that even back then, I think, you know, lessons learned and all that kind of thing, uh, there are some things that I, if I was to go back and do that work again, I'd certainly be approaching some of those things differently. We are going to talk about a couple of those things today. Amanda. And alongside, you know, that knowing your direction, and you know, that as as well as that, it's really being prepared to go out to market. So you you know your direction, and now we're we're really pulling together the market requests. So the information that you're going to put in there, you need to be, have that prepared and make sure it's clear and easy to understand. Um, there's transparency, and people can respond in the right way. So, you know, when I'm talking about preparedness, you know, we talk about either too much detail or information in a market request, you know, if, if, it, if you're not prepared, you often put too much information in because we haven't had the time to refine it and make sure absolutely clear. And that's going to create confusion. It, it might mean that, you know, possible great partners or vendors may not respond because they don't understand what you're asking for or when they respond back, they, they come back with an overcomplicated or an overpriced response because they're having to make huge assumptions and, and they truly don't understand what, what you're trying to achieve, so they're giving you everything. And that can be really hard to evaluate and understand what their true capability and offering is in that, in that instance. So you might miss the perfect partner altogether. Um, but if then, if you don't put in enough information, if you keep it too simple, then you're not, they're not gonna have the full picture and they're gonna make assumptions and you're actually gonna get a, a, a an offering that may not meet your actual desired business outcomes of what you truly want and what success looks like in the at the end of it so that will likely need to, you'll need to change scope you'll have to add um timelines and in budget will have to increase to actually get what you need even and so it won't match what the vendors are providing so one of the first steps you know i think i mean prepared is first of all knowing what you want from the market you know you're going out there to build understanding of options in asking those questions so you can actually make, you can create a better market request when you're ready for that. Um, are you partnering up? You know, do you want someone to help you along the full journey? Or you're buying just a product, you've got everything, all the support and resources, you just want the product? Or are you looking for products and services? It's really thinking about those key things that are gonna better support um, you and your organization moving forward. And I think the, the, the tagline here is, if you're not clear on what you want, then you're unlikely to get back what you need. So um, Yvonne has got a great example of a recent uh, government agency request that we responded to recently and it was very challenging and she's going to run you through how through that and how it impacted our response to them. Yeah so the the agency was looking for support to do a, a work breakdown uh, to Oh, sorry, an understanding of their services and then a work breakdown to help them uh, side development if it required to, to move those things, those kind of processes uh, into a new environment. Um, the, the request document that came out was in excess of 40 pages um, and it was all very, um, uh, so, so from our perspective, there was a lot of information in there, but our take on it was that there was nothing to start. This was a this was a clean slate. You had to go in and and start by understanding end to end the service and all of the the data flows through the service, all of the the um, all of the actors and um, uh, profiles of the different people who were involved in it. All of the basically everything from from woe to go. Um, it also had a, a very short time frame for delivery. So um, the, the kind of the total amount of work was about two months. Um, and given there was nothing clear in the RFP around what already existed, the only thing we could do was respond as if we were going in brand new and no work had yet been done or you know, no work had been established. 
Um, and so we put out our approach as if that was the the uh, that was the the position. We might, we made an assumption based on what we read that there was not a whole lot of existing collateral to start with. Um, and so uh, we went back with we think it's you know in the time frame you're talking about and the kind of um, uh, level of information that you need to inform your next work. Um, we think it's going to probably need two teams working in this approach, um, and and even then it's probably going to be pretty tight. Um, now we 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 didn't. Um, when that response uh, we asked for feedback and the feedback we got kind of got us thinking a bit more about this it's part of the reason for why we're kind of talking about this topic today um, the feedback we got was they really loved our approach they loved our breakdown of work they think that um, this would have been terrific but the cost for them was was not um, it was cost prohibitive um, because we were looking at two teams and uh, and those teams were were reasonably full of different disciplines to kind of achieve the the full um, information set they were wanting uh, and so it was it was really good to get feedback that our approach was great but actually if we'd had greater context of what they already had the baseline to start from um, we would likely have gone back with a, a much more tailored response that would have given them what they thought was a really good approach within the, the, the context and confine that they were working within. So that was kind of a, um, an area where um, we, we put our best foot forward based on what we understood from their request, uh, but there were things missing from that request that would have ultimately changed our response quite significantly. Uh, Amanda, I think we're going to move into uh, some myth busting. Yeah. So yeah, so while we, you know, we know not all market engagements are technology implementations. Um, a lot of them, a lot of them are that we deal with, and some of those statements that you may have heard when a company decides to go with a SaaS or a COTS solution is, you know, it's out of the box, just configuration. It's going to be easy, straightforward. Configuration is easier than customization. Um, just plug it in, turn it on, and we're good to go. Or the best one is the vendor is going to provide us with all the best practices and we're just going to align to these. I'm not sure, I'm sure a few of you might have heard of those. Um, and, it, you know, that makes my eyes twitch and a bit, get a bit jittery when I hear all those things because I usually know that we're on a journey, a tough journey ahead. Um, so for me, I, I feel like the vendor sales teams, they're great at selling the dream. And some of our decision making business stakeholders who are involved, you know, they might have limited experience within this type of implementations. And so, you know, they come out with sort of may have un unrealistic expectations um, that need to truly be understood and possibly realigned as early as possible. And I've seen the consequence of not realigning those expectations because we often we get these unrealistic, um, the unrealistic views can have ramifications right throughout the project. And, you know, from uh, particularly in the uh, allocation of resources, so not having the right people at the right time because we didn't think we needed it in the budget in the realistic time frames for delivery because they thought it was very easy so we weren't going to have to do much work to you know configure or design or anything like that so often you know there's a lot of workarounds at the end because we didn't put enough time in at the front of that um space so actually if you hear those words come out of one of your senior management's mouths and and maybe it's trying to find a time to talk them through actually the con you know the the rigor that needs to go into any implementation of, a, a, of software. Um, so the key message is, you know, while you want to take advantage of those features and functionality that are standard, you know, out of the box, you know, and that's the, the key thing, use, um, if you've got standard, um, not non-unique processes and ways of working, you use it out of the box, but you also need to know and showcase your business knowledge and IP. You know, it's a differentiator to the organisa your organisation and the way it delivers products and services. So you need to ensure that you don't lose that your business's uniqueness or USP, as, as the sales team like to call it. You know, make sure that it's still within that that implementation. Um, an example I've got, yeah, it's sort of around the lack of a bit of misunderstanding between uh, of context was I worked for an insurance company a while back and. We, you know, we had for many years worked with a custom built insurance management system, which was end of life and, and we needed to um, to change. And, and first of all, they thought about rebuilding it themselves, but then they moved on to the let's uh, get an out of a box solution and uh, a vendor and the product was chosen. It's from the US. And a part of that process, there was a discovery which sort of ran through all the key modules and functionality that we needed. Um, deep dive in some areas, but not in others. So a lot of most of it was just tick box. So, like, so example, 
underwriting, yes, claims, yes, you know, they've got that, so that's fine. And we had the, our decision makers, um, a lot of them weren't in the, in, this, in the sort of IT area, so they were from a business perspective, which is great, but they, um, they had a bit of a lack of understanding around some of our uniqueness that we had in, 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 in those areas. So as we're working through the implementation of this out-of-the-box solution and we're focusing on the claims area, it quickly became clear that the expectations around the standard functionality within the claim module did not fit our needs. So the vendor implementation team couldn't understand what our concerns were and kept saying, well, it's complete. We've got everything you need. Why do you keep asking for more? You know, And we were just saying, we just, where's the rest of it? Like, it can't be just that. There's got to be more because we need to do all this stuff. And it was, you know, we quickly came to the realization that in America, they don't, you know, they pay claims, they approve and pay claims. Whereas in New Zealand, we approve and we manage claims. So we actually had to have all this functionality around managing the claim. And like if it was a house rebuild, we would project manage that. If it was a car repair, we'd manage that. Sometimes we'd pay a claim, but not all the time. So there was a complete difference in, in the way that we worked. And I know things have changed slightly with the earthquakes and there's a lot more payouts than there used to be, but it still is the same, right? You know, that's our, our uniqueness. And as, as New Zealand Australia market is a lot different than the US market. And it was a lesson that was a costly lesson because we, we had to then um, change the scope, custom build those pieces of functionality to put into that into that area. So there's a um, uh, following on from from what Amanda was just talking about in terms of uh, you know getting clear on the context of your business. Um, the the information that you use to engage the market, there's also some things that, um, harking back to the, the um, example I just gave earlier around, you know, we responded with some assumptions, part of, part of that uh, response was also because the, the request to the market was very much kind of um, function based and so uh, it was difficult to apply a lens um, that we could relate more easily to. Um, so what we've seen work really well in market engagement documents is a structure that is actually um, people-centered. And uh, you know, there's a lot of kind of flippant comments around, um, uh, well, not flippant comments. <laughs> uh, there, there is often a bit of a, uh, when it comes to, you know, IT documents should be technology documents, particularly if you're going out to request technology, it should be, you know, should have a technology lens. Um, but actually one of the bigger challenges that uh, we see in the market engagement process um, is very much around the people who are participating. And a lot of them aren't technology people. And more and more, own thing. It's, it's uh, being integrated into more uh, business-focused, business-standard roles. Um, we think that applying a people-centered approach to any documents that you are uh, sharing out in the market will stand both you and the market in, in a much better position to be able to engage. Anything that's kind of a business function or a, a list of requirements or a domain model, uh, there's no reason why these things can't actually sit easily underneath a structure that's more like this. And when we talk about people, um, there are, for most businesses, there's really kind of three key domains of people within the business. Um, and then for a market engagement, there's a fourth domain. So when we talk about um, customers, these are these are for your business, the people who ultimately are the, the benefactor of what you're doing, uh, whether they're purchasing from you or you are serving them in, a, in more of a government context. Um, these are the, the, the people for whom your business exists. Then there's the people in your business who serve those people, who are kind of the, the, the human face, the human aspect of your business and they have their own distinct and unique needs as part of service to customers um, and then you've got your business itself all the people who care about how that service is being delivered um, so people who who have risk roles and responsibilities that include um, assurance and controls or reporting or financial management these these people aren't necessarily um, facing and fronting and needing to manage the relationship and interaction with the customer but they are most definitely needing to manage across your business um, now when you're going to market for um, if you're going to market for any kind of digital solution usually there is a context of um, at least integration with service channels if not introducing new service channels um, and so Having a, a people first kind of approach to this is, is something that we think there's huge value in. That, that fourth box around partnership, 
Um, this is something that um, I've, I've recently had experience with um, that uh, I can see why there have been challenges in um, through market engagement, but more probably more importantly after market engagement when you've got your chosen uh, provider or vendor coming in to join you. Um, and that is around partnerships. So my recent experience, I was asked to provide uh, a review of um, uh, for a, a, a council that was going out to market. Um, they had their, their request for proposal content ready. Um, it, was, it was broken into, well, it was, it was about 47 pages, um, and it was broken into all of the kind of functional um, areas that they wanted to achieve um, uh, efficiency on or, or create new opportunities. The interesting challenge with this is that they weren't going out to the market to to purchase technology. They had already determined the technology. They were going out to market to find a partner to work with them to implement and evolve their um, their use, their support, the enablement of that technology. And in that uh, enormous document, there were there was less than a third of a page, maybe four or five sentences that referred quite specifically to their expectations of a partner. Um, we're going to talk a little bit more about this partner, um, this partner piece a little bit later in this um, presentation. But one of the other reasons why we would be advocating for a very human-centered approach to structuring any engagement with the market um, is you do yourself a lot of favors. It does allow people to have more uh, participation in the process. If you think about uh, particularly going out for RFP and you've got a whole lot of people in your organisation who are going to be on the um, assessment panel, uh, by, by keeping this very human-centred, it enables greater participation from non-technical people in assessing responses. It also creates a really good structure to be able to um, for, for vendors to respond to, um, it, you know, if you keep the structure in place for their responses, and it gives far greater ability for doing the um, compare assess. You kind of, you know, you're having a, a much better apples with apples view when you're looking at the responses from the market. Um, it's yeah, it, it's a, it's an it's a way of doing this that we think not only provides good market engagement um, and improved people participation. But also, uh, if you keep flowing through to post-engagement, you've got a vendor on board, you've got a system that's been built out. Um, this structure also creates some ease and traceability right the way through. Um, if you're thinking about um, the way that many organisations work today with features and um, users, uh, user stories, uh, you can see how you could trace right the way back from uh, a market engagement right the way down to um, the, the features and stories that are being uh, developed and delivered. So key takeaways, um, your responders will be trying to put their best foot forward. Um, or if you're a responder, you'll be wanting to put your best foot forward. So there's some, so there's some key things that, that, uh, that we can do through an engagement process to make it easier for all parties to not only um, clearly convey the context that matters in the context of the market engagement, but also provide the best opportunity for getting uh, as many uh, people, as many organisations in the market involved, interested in participating. If you, if the specifics of, it's the specifics of your business context that matter in the context of what, what you're going to the market for. Um, so we're going to talk very shortly about how to get some uh, really good clarity on the specific context of your business within the context of going to market. Um, so, That'll help also support what we think are some great ways to um, get clear and ready to enter the into the market engagement. Um, Amanda talked a bit about out of the box. It's not a myth, but actually, once again, it comes back to being really clear on your business knowledge will give your vendor and you a much better opportunity to understand what you can leverage out of the box and where you have a unique point of difference um, that is going to require something different. Um, this, if you think about how this flows forward, this then goes into a kind of a size cost estimate of effort and um, of the work to, to achieve whatever outcome your business is trying to achieve. Um, and then the last thing here is um, human and business, not technology centered. This, this, is, this is about people and business. Um, technology is the enabler. Uh, and so just being really clear first and foremost 
uh, for people in business, what's important, what's needed, what's the context. Um, as I said, technology is the enabler. So this will this will um, create greater room for participation um, and also greater confidence that you've got um, people who are not technical but can uh, be fully engaged in the process and do a, a really good kind of compare apples with apples. So we've just talked a lot about being clear on what you're asking for from the market and making sure that you're ready to enter that uh, market engagement. So if you aren't clear or in a rush, this is going to this can be where assumptions are made in the creation of the market request, which then leads to more assumptions being made by the respondees to your market request. So we're going to talk a little bit around uh, in the next few slides around um, assumptions and and that they do matter. The less assumptions that the vendor has to make, the better and the more on point of response you should get. So the removal or, or creating room for these to show up clearly um, should result in a, in a greater confidence for the market, for your business, and for your ability to confidently assess and compare in the complete responses. So how can you reduce the number and breadth of these assumptions in your market request? Well, we think you know a, a big part of that is that clarity, transparency, and alignment. You know, if we can um, agree and align, if you can agree and align your business priorities, know and document your knowledge anchors and know the sweet spot of detail, you know, how much is enough. If you can get that right, then you're on the on the right track to making sure that you've reduced the assumptions as much as possible and the clarity is, is in there for those uh, quality responses that you're looking for. So we'll kick right into um, starting starting from the top and kind of working our way down. There's a, there's a couple of um, levels, layers to, to what we're about to talk about. Um, so this particular um, slide that you're looking at, this is a project success slider. Um, it's, it was introduced by Rob Tomset as part of, uh, well, in a book that he wrote many, many years ago now uh, around radical project management. Um, it's something that we think is incredibly powerful for both um, the preparation for going to and the engagement with, and then the subsequent implementation from a market engagement. So project success sliders are a reasonably is a reasonably simple tool. Um, the way that this works is is really a, a, a firm hierarchical prioritisation. Uh, to start with, the best the best way to use this tool is to get your significant stakeholders, your business stakeholders, uh, together, um, and uh, introduce them to this exercise. Um, the, as you can see along the, the top of the table, we've got uh, from least important to most important. And down the right hand side, you've got a, a series of different things. And most of those things down the right hand side will look familiar. Now, often uh, the, the kind of, <laughs> to, to coin the phrase differently, the out of the box of the project success sliders from radical project management has, a, has only six of these, but you can introduce and, and change these as they as you see fit for your organization. But you'll see on the right hand side, there are things in there that um, you've probably seen in market engagement previously or in um, uh, business case development. So things like deliver on budget, deliver on time, uh, you know, they're, they're kind of pretty standard for any project approach. Um, the way that you use this is you have your right hand uh, side, you actually give a copy of this tool to every single one of your stakeholders. Uh, and you ask them to complete it based on what their their view is. And whatever they determine to be most important, you ask them to provide their rationale. So you can see in this example, um, the most important here is being selected as improved quality data and the rationale for, for quality data has been given. You give it to each of your senior stakeholders, you get them to independently do it, and then you bring them back to the table and uh, they just uh, work through it until they can agree one common position. So that's where some of the best conversation happens because you get the different perspectives of the different senior stakeholders who all have a very strong vested interest in what happens here. You get their, their um, input, you get them to agree on one position and then it can be helpful to share this as part of your engagement with the market but it most certainly will be helpful for whatever the, the program or project or business group is that is going to be um, uh, working on, focused on whatever the, the change or the, the, the work is. Uh, so from the very beginning of um, a business investment case, uh, a market engagement and subsequent um, project activity, this is a really great way of declaring the priorities that the business has if they had to do a, a one to six of these things. Um, 
this is also, so if you think about um, market engagement, this, this is a really good signal for people in terms of when they're responding, where would they be best spending their time, effort and energy? What are the things that matter most? Because um, when we go out to market, we have a you know, great vision, mission kind of um, outcomes that we're looking for, and, and we need all of those things. But if we have to make a trade-off, what's the trade-off? So having that clarity around what the business position is on trade-offs is, is really helpful in terms of energy investment. Take that down into, um, you've gone through the market uh, engagement activity, made a selection, you're actually now doing some change work. Um, the project teams that are working in that change area, particularly if they're working um, in more, a more of an agile um, delivery methodology, there's an expectation that those teams have a level of autonomy and decision making. They are doing things like creating, maintaining, refining their backlog of work. Um, this position, um, it won't be granular enough to deal with all the nuances on that kind of project, um, sorry, product backlog. Um, however, it is a really great starting point for a product owner, for example, to look across all of the um, optional work or you know stuff in their backlog and start to apply a bit of a prioritization lens on it based on this. So, so as a start position, it's terrific for getting your business on the same page. It's great for helping your market understand if they have to trade off on things, here's what the business believe that looks like. Um, and then it's also great to help the decision making and prioritization of work post introduction of whatever project you're doing. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about um, knowledge anchors. So this is kind of the next level down. So that the project success side is that's kind of setting up a, a priority view that your business agrees to. Um, knowledge anchors are that there's quite a few different ones. We're going to start with um, terminology without context. So um, what this means is so, so almost every uh, every time we go out to market, every time we see documents that have been put out to the market, um, the document will have a, a glossary of terms, and that glossary of terms will cover terms that are used in that document, which is what a glossary's purpose is. Um, if you take that glossary of terms a step further and talk about it as this is the terms that are in use for our business in the context of the solution we're looking for, that's that's a that's a different layer of detail, um, and we we often see um, we well we, we we'll often see terms used in market engagement documents that are business terms that have a description for them, which is great, um, but a very small shift can create a, a far greater value in this. Um, so I, I'm just gonna I'm gonna show you one thing, and then I'm well I'm just gonna show you this this work is outstanding, right? So so my question is always. Does that mean this is great work, or is it not finished yet? And so, you know, if you're a, if you're a human and you're having a conversation, um, even the nuance of inflection in your tone could probably answer this. Um, but if you're moving to a, a digital context, your machine isn't going to hear any inflection in tone. Your your system isn't going to understand that. Um, there's some other really you know really dumb but good examples of um, we understand this because we're human. Um, our systems won't understand this unless we are explicit and 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 um, and make that kind of absolute. So um, there's a um, Ronald J. Ross is a um, business rules specialist, uh, and if you want to go and search on some of his stuff, uh, there, there's a there's a raft of stuff out there. But he uses this really cool little um, uh, cartoon that is um, dog barber. And, and for, for all of us, we're all people, we know that you know dogs don't cut hair. Dog barber is someone who grooms dogs. Um, but actually, if you're a machine, you could, you could be sitting here thinking, not thinking, you could be sitting here uh, with uh, a context that is, okay, we're looking at a dog who cuts hair. So as I said, it's a really dumb example, but, but there are lots of things like this. And perhaps more in the areas that business analysts work in, we see this turn up a lot with things like, um, was it a product or a service? When we say client, what do we mean? You know, there's there's a whole lot of things that need um, some absolute clarity of definition. I'm going to give you an example of um, how we can take that uh, glossary and turn it into something much more meaningful uh, and much more powerful in terms of context and understanding. So this is a once again really basic example. Um, uh, don't worry about whether you call it a concept or a context map. It doesn't it doesn't matter. Concept model is is a specific modelling technique. Um, and that noun-verb-noun relationship is the, um, 
uh, is what is portrayed in a concept model. A concept model is generally built around a domain. Um, a domain, if you think about your business domains, it could be finance, it could be HR, it could be one of your product or service areas. Um, but just, just for um, a kind of a short uh, example, so this list of things that you can, the two lists of things you can see on this page, the PMO strategy, capability, benefits, budget, money, OPEX, these are all terms that you would expect to hear if you were working in a project management office. And I've just realized looking at the screen, I haven't actually stated project management office anywhere. So my apologies for that. Um, so these are terms that you'd hear uh, in a project management office. And if you were sitting in that office and working uh, in that space, you'd have context because this is your environment. You're familiar with it. You've heard the different um, connotations and contexts of use. But if you're coming in here new, this is just a, a list of words. And those list of words, they may well have descriptions, but it doesn't give you the next layer of context. So, so um, a, a business analyst in, in the construct of a project management office, what is that? So a very short step to introduce the noun verb noun. And you can see that same, those same lists of words, PMO, projects, business analysts, um, they're all represented on the screen. The difference is there is now a relationship between those things. And, uh, and even though you could achieve some of this with the description of each of the terms, actually truly deep context is possible by creating this view. So um, a PMO engages capability, for example, project management, business analysis. The PMO delivers projects, it supports governance. Um, governance decides investment. So, so you, you, get the, you get the the gist of it. So when we talk about uh, a concept model, the concept model is kind of um, generally done at a domain level. You can, you can, you can do it at an organization level, um, absolutely. Uh, but breaking it down to a domain level is, is really useful. Um, glossary of terms, if you're thinking about the glossary of terms for your business, as I said, glossary of terms usually exists within a document to talk about terms that are used in the document. Um, but if this is uh, trying to create context of the, the business or the domain that you are wanting to, to affect some change in or get some market engagement to get support with, um, that glossary of terms uh, is highly likely to be derived for government agencies from ledge or policy or service related terminology. Um, for commercial companies, it's generally their product or service offerings. Um, there'll they'll obviously be common business domains and I'll, I'll touch on that in just a moment. So uh, the whole reason for promoting a concept model is while it might be a common domain, um, it allows you to surface the things that might be unique within that common domain. So a couple of examples I've got on the right here. Uh, so a common domain uh, of finance, for example. Um, finance, for the most part, finance is finance. You'll have invoicing, you'll have GL codes, you'll have payment reconciliation, you, you know, you've got all your financial management. Um, and, and, and it's reasonably there's a reasonable level of, of common and standard um, regardless of business. Um, but sometimes there are, well, in fact, there, there's often very unique kind of attributes. And so one example I can talk about was um, an organisation I worked for not long ago, and uh, we were working very much on trying to create the, the domain concept for finance because this was a reasonably complex uh, existing very complex area and needing to transition to something that would enable in time more um, simplicity. Uh, we needed to take a bit of time to kind of work this through. And one of the things that uh, was not common uh, was the common chart of accounts. Uh, so most organisations who have a common chart of accounts, you know, they have multiple divisions and they all kind of reference one common chart of accounts. There's generally one common chart of accounts. This particular organisation had three. It had a historic one, a current one, and an emerging one. And the, the different need that this organization had was to actually manage and map that. So the solution that was being sought from the market needed to understand that context. Um, another example is a, the common domain of kind of customer service, where, where there'll be all sorts of things that are common, you know, channels that are often common in terms of customer service. Um, but if you think about um, the, the difference that matters in the context of going to market. If you're going to market for a customer relationship management system, for example, um, think a, 
I don't know, Microsoft Dynamics kind of an environment, but that kind of thing, or a Salesforce. Um, there'll be things that come out of the box. Once again, you know, hackles should be standing up at this point. Um, so out of the box are, will be a couple of options for customer profiles, but it's actually really important to understand your customer service domain and your customers um, in a way that can reflect to the vendor the kind of need that you have for a customer profile. And the reason why in a CRM uh, purchase, the reason why this is so important is that's a foundation implementation. If you get that wrong, your ability to achieve the outcome your business wants could be severely compromised. Um, a really simple example, if you're a company that sells beds, um, your client profile is likely to be reasonably simple um, where you have someone who is perhaps a, um, a, a, market, a client that you market to or someone who's been into your showroom. Um, it might be someone who's purchased a bed and you might want to you know, reconnect with them in a few years' time to see whether they're looking to purchase a new bed. There's a, there's a reasonably simple kind of relationship there. If you then look at a very different organisation, like a, like a regional council, uh, for a regional council, that client profile needs to be understood in quite a different context. Um, so me, uh, I, you know, I, I have a regional council that I'm uh, a, a customer client of. Um, I could be a, a local council, sorry. Um, I could be a, a rate payer in that. I could be a rate payer customer. I could be a dog owner customer. I could be a customer who um, engages with council to perform um, uh, building consent activity. Um, I could be a landlord. There's all sorts of different things that I might be in the context of that relationship with the council. Um, so when it comes to setting up the, the client profile or the client, yeah, the client profile in a customer relationship management environment, understanding not only the, the client, um, you know, the customer relationships you have, but also how they integrate um, is, becomes really important. That's going to be quite a critical thing for a vendor in the market to respond um, to enable them to respond more appropriately with with out of the box out of the box versus here's the additional effort we're going to have to put in to give this to you in the way that you need it, um, and so it's it's really important to to take the time to really articulate those kinds of things um, in that client profile space within the within running the business it might be reasonably um, simple still to use an out of the box but think forward one more step to, okay, what are all the self-service channels? And if I'm, if I'm just me trying to engage with my local council, how am I logging in? What am I doing? What, what does this mean? Because I'll be turning up with, you know, as the same person, but with different hats on. Um, and so getting real context for that will do, um, will put you in a really good position to get um, far better information back from your market around what the actual implementation of that is likely to include. Um, and then there are domains that are kind of um, your unique domains. So um, if we think about health services for aged people, that's that's kind of a, you know, a domain that needs the, the context, the same noun, verb, noun, um, the, the what's, the things that are very important and the relationship between those things. With that domain, with those domain concept models, um, this is also where um, we, so I, I have certainly experienced this myself. I'm sure there's many on the call who have also experienced this. To put a, um, perhaps a less appropriate uh, statement on it, what we want to avoid is the, ta the tail wagging the dog. We want this to be in, in every market engagement, with every solution that we end up procuring from the market, this, this needs to be business-led, business-driven. Um, business domain concept models are a great way to articulate the what the truth, the fact of your business. Logical data models are a great way to transition your business concept models into something that is more consumable um, and translatable to a technology solution. What I've seen and what I've seen are um, uh, technology partners, technology come into an organization and th this, the first two steps haven't been done. And it's very much a tail wagging the dog because this system has come in and here's the physical data model. And now you need to try and reverse engineer that to your business and do it in a way that's going to allow you to have you know, as, as um, minimal disruption as possible. Um, and that's, that's, that's not, not a great experience for anyone. Um, certainly, it can create quite a bit of um, tension and 
and result in far greater change to your organisation than you had maybe wanted or anticipated. So this is this should always be business informs technology and those first two pieces, the business concept model and the logical data model. Um, my belief that those, those things should be things that are information anchors before you engage the market. It will make life a whole lot easier and create a whole lot more clarity. So this is something that I think for lots of business analysts in particular, there's a bit of a, whoa, hang on a second. Um, if, you're, if you're going out to market and you're looking for um, a solution that is going to enable you to kind of move to software as a service as opposed to uh, on-prem tin, it's actually less important to get all your rules sorted. And, and I say that, um, I'm not saying that flippantly, actually, one of the things that's most important is that it's the business decisions that matter. Your, your business decisions are, are kind of a constant state. Those are the things that always need to, to happen with delivery of product or service to your business customers. Um, and so what decisions need to be made? Um, because when you're doing any kind of transformation or introducing new technology, you're going to have a multitude of options of how you use your data differently, how you might wire your processes differently, and you'll have any number of different opportunities as to how you might satisfy the rules in the, in the new world. Um, so sticking first with the business decisions that matter um, mean that you don't spend a huge amount of time, energy and effort uh, trying to reverse engineer out of legacy systems, for example, rules. Um, there are obviously there are there are risks that need to be managed if you don't um, or aren't able to to reverse engineer rules. But actually, starting with your business decisions is a really good stable um, information anchor. Um, so the way that I kind of look at this is that decisions are unique to your business. They are the IP that matters. Those decisions, the, as I said, the rules can be satisfied in any, no, any number of ways. Um, processes integrate data and workflow activity, and rules execute within process. So the rules execute within process, but only to enable a business decision. Um, so once again, coming back to business decisions are less, you know, are, are more stable. Um, uh, the comment around processes integrate. Um, so processes are absolutely an integrator. And so um, Amanda's going to talk about this in just a moment. Um, but the the what we have seen time and time again is an enormous amount of detailed processes going out to market. Um, and a, a process kind of gives a slice and view across uh, an end-to-end -end of something. It doesn't give um, some of the business context that matters. Um, and those are, you know, the, those domain models, those unique aspects of your business versus what might be more common. This is a, this is a view, a very, this is just a very basic view of um, business decision modeling. Um, and as I said, if you want to understand a bit more about this, feel free to hit me up later. Um, and I'm going to stop there and hand over to Amanda, who's going to talk a little bit about the process side of things. Yes, as Yvonne just referred to, you know, a lot of times we see a lot of process mapped as a preparation for uh, a, an implementation or, you know, uh, either going out with a market request or being prepared for afterwards. Um, and, you know, there's an age-old question is around current state analysis. How much is too much? And, and you know, and there is different opinions and I've had experience of different levels and different requests from we're not doing anything, we'll just take whatever comes out of the box from the, the implementation um, and or just enough to highlight the business landscape and specific areas of high risk or value to the business. Or um, I've even done where they had complete documentation of current state um, to a really low level um, and, and, and it honestly took about a year to do this, a very costly exercise. And the key reason for that was that the information that we needed um, wasn't, we couldn't get it any, it was really only held in people's heads and in the code of the current system. So a lot of time was taken to truly pull, unweave and pull that out. And, and it's a, something I would suggest that we wouldn't want to do very often. So it's looking after your data in the future was a very important thing for this organisation, realising that they should manage their information better. Um, so the amount of detail that you know I think we really need is it's truly dependent on your business levels level of uniqueness and complexity you know within its business decisions interactions and data that you need uh, that it needs to be understood and communicated to the vendor as part of that request so um it's really just making those decisions around you know to provide that clarity of and, and truly understanding your businesses but what we um what we see often is, as I said, the processes are used to understand that current business state, um, the business knowledge, and it's finding that sweet spot, you know, and not, and not, um, 
going too far into the detail. So what we often talk about the level three, if people, you know, the BAs on the call will understand this, the level three gives you enough information to understand, you know, where there's decision points and things like that, so you can dig into. And, and what I sort of, the, the key message here is the key thing around these processes, what you're doing, is you're not really trying to uh, focus on the flow, you're really trying to understand the business information that's captured within and hidden within inside that process flow. So you don't necessarily need to model or map the processes in a flow uh, diagram. Um, actually, and, and I've used uh, different ways to do that, and I use a, uh, um, a technique called um, SIPOP, which is a Lean Six Sigma technique, and that and it has enabled me to capture the, the information within the proce uh, processes very, very quickly, but focusing it more on actually the information that's enabling those process activities rather than the flow itself. So, you know, with, with the SIPOC, it was it really show, showcases that it's the information that's flowing into the air. Um, and this example was, you know, I, I actually couldn't do the work myself. It had to be done um, because of the, the, the business unit was in a different, a different city and we didn't really have the technology at the time to really connect so well as we do today. So I had a wonderful person down there that I was able to really teach the technique to quite quickly and, and she went out and captured a huge amount of information very very quickly um, that enabled us to pass over to our implementers that were they could immediately see there was a lot more use of spreadsheets for data capture and things like that and systems that we hadn't even talked about and interfaces that would have to connect to or figure out what they were doing um, as part of these processes that they were about to implement so it, you know, it is it's something that you could use very quickly and get, get the information you need um, to help with that future state design. And I think the key thing here when we talk about it is really don't waste your time on getting those detailed current state flows unless you really want to build the current state into your new technology. All right. So um, key takeaways from this section. So um, overtly agreeing business priorities. Uh, that's that's uh, decision making knowledge anchor. So as I said, starting from your most senior stakeholders right the way through all of this journey to uh, teams working on implementing um, business concept models. The the what, <clears throat> the facts, the what of your business and the relationship between those facts. Um, it's you know taking taking a, a, a glossary and um, transforming that into something much more contextually rich and meaningful um, is a, a great way to, you know, very small amount of effort to create something far more meaningful um, and, and result in a far greater level of understanding. Um, business decision models are um, knowledge anchors for digital innovation. So um, if, you, if you're clear on your business decisions, uh, it's much easier to understand the opportunities you've got in a new world to, to have the information available to satisfy those decisions at different points in, in, in a process or, or, um, or reuse different data or, or there's just, just to better understand the opportunities if you're looking at business decision and not just rules. Um, what we have seen are uh, rules that get, uh, you know, that exist in a current state and they get implemented in a future state and no one stopped to question, why do we even run that rule? Um, and, and when they do, they realise that actually the only reason that they ran that rule was because the old technology couldn't do something. Um, and as Amanda's just talked through, SIPOC creates, uh, collates uh, technology and solution context. And so rather than kind of modding out a whole lot of details of um, process, uh, creating that kind of um, information view of the things that are relevant for the different processes that you need to be uh, delivering. Um, I just want to stop for a second. Um, Cass or Steve, are there any questions that have been called out so far? Yeah, um, absolutely. Um, we had one that came in reference um, agencies that needed the work breakdown. Was there an opportunity to ask the agency for clarification on your assumptions? Ah, so that's a great question, actually. And we did we did ask some questions through that. Uh, so this was through the the government electronic tendering service. We did we did raise some questions. Um, the responses we got were helpful for some areas, but certainly didn't give us enough of the understanding that we needed. Um, so yes, there was an opportunity, but not, but um, we couldn't ask well. We tried asking for something that sounded like a work breakdown and were um, directed back to the detail of the RFP. Great. Thank you. I hope hopefully that answers that question. 
Uh, we had another one, which was, what is the ideal time that should be taken to develop and review an RFP before releasing to the market? <laughs> I'm going to use Amanda's favorite response. It depends. Um, actually, um, uh, in terms of creation, I think creation depends because it really does depend on how big a chunk of your business is, is it likely to be um, changed as a result of what you're going to market for. But in terms of reviewing the RFP um, before it goes to market, um, I would I'm, I would really encourage that agencies allow, or any organisation that's going out, allows at least two weeks and is really careful about who they bring in to do the review. So bringing in people who are a totally fresh pair of eyes, who haven't had involvement um, and, and behave as if they are going to respond to this is a really great way to kind of sanity check um, and work out whether you've got... Um, whether you've miscommunicated something or whether there are gaps or whether whether there are assumptions that that person is making or those people are making that you can actually um, clarify before submitting it out into the public domain. Um, so I'd suggest allow, allow two weeks for a review and have that review by people who are independent of the creation process. Um, it's a great way to just do a kind of a sanity check, you know, do a, almost a user test before you go out. Can I add to that, Yvonne? I think in, in something we forget often is the language we use in a business. While we think it's common and standard, it actually is relevant to the business. So even in assumptions, it comes from within a langu the language we use. So if you can get somebody that doesn't understand that language and if they can understand what you're saying, then it's all good. But if they're asking, what do you mean by that? You know, do you mean this or this or this? Then actually that can showcase that you're actually, you're, the words you're using are not clear. So you need to make it clear for everybody. So it's just adding adding to the what Yvonne just said there. Brilliant. Thank you, Amanda and Yvonne. Um, and uh, a final question that's come through. Um, referring to the page, which was, uh, I think it was the same page, business priorities, um, slide 17. Um, can these business goals be converted to KPIs to measure the success post-project implementation? Absolutely, they absolutely can. Um, so some of them, of course, would translate more than others. Um, but I think the the key thing here is so so these could actually start from existing KPIs if if that's where you wanted to kind of focus things. But for each of those things, um, yeah, there's no reason why you couldn't take the the project success. I think that's the project success slide as you're talking about. Um, why you couldn't take each of those um, business areas or um, or um, you know, ideal outcomes uh, and translate those into KPIs to then allow the rest of the program to not only structure and implement, but measure against that. I think that's a, um, I have seen it, I have seen it done with some of those areas. Um, things like the, the things like uh, managing on time and on budget, those things are perhaps a little bit um, more uh, black and white uh, in terms of, um, uh, evidence assessment, but the, but deriving KPIs for the other things or creating KPIs for the other areas, um, you could absolutely get to hard measurable fact uh, to enable those things to work in that way. That's great. Thank you, Yvonne. Um, so those are the questions we have um, so far. Please, mm -hmm. I would encourage uh, people um, to submit questions. We will have a Q&A session at the end. So back to you, Yvonne. Cool. Thank you. All right, the last section that we're going to talk through is around partnering roles and responsibilities. Um, and this is an area that, that we've seen all sorts of interesting um, challenges surface in uh, for, for lots of different reasons, some of which we'll, we'll cover off. Um, so uh, many of you have probably seen this before. Um, and this is a very kind of high level, loose way to kind of look at it. But uh, if you are the person going to the market, um, your role is making sure that the right thing is understood, right? the, the, that your business is understood. Um, and there's some things that um, every single market engagement will include, and they generally you see um, good uh, information around customer or user needs. You generally see some good information about the problem, but uh, for the business analysts on the call, I'm sure this won't come as any surprise. Um, what we often see are... Um, a request for a solution that is described, the solution is described, the problem is not. Uh, and so um, getting really clear 
problem statements, clear and agreed problem statements is also a great way to keep both the engagement on track, um, but the subsequent um, project activity on track. So, so fundamentally, what is the problem that is trying to be solved? Um, business IP, we've, we've talked uh, a little bit about some ways to kind of create greater context and clarity and, and have your business IP really um, anchored in some knowledge artifacts that can be referenced. Um, so, so building the right thing is very much around your ability to describe the thing right. Um, the vendor and partner's role is around building that thing right. And so often what we see, particularly in software implementation, software as a service, um, we, we see that whole kind of um, responsibility and role of the, the partner or vendor is to put in place the hygiene factors for the establishment and ongoing um, evolution of whatever the, the product is. Um, now, there are, you'll see that uh, in that efficiency space, creating efficient engineering practice is just an, an example, but basically the hygiene factor associated with this. You'll see that speed to deliver changes, ease and confidence to adapt. I've actually put um, asterisks on both of those. And there's a, and I haven't actually put the, the reason for that on the slide. Um, so speed to deliver changes and ease and confidence to adapt. Um, they are absolutely uh, something that you, you can and should expect your vendor and partner to, to help you with. However, um, ease and confidence to adapt or speed to deliver changes, a lot of that is going to be dependent on your ability to understand impact. Um, so as we move more and more into digital environments where we automate a lot of process, uh, we move from people doing the doing to our systems doing the doing. And when you've no longer got people doing the doing, you haven't got someone you can call on to say, oh, how does that work? And if I change that, what happens? And if you haven't documented or modeled that anywhere, then it only really exists under the hood of your, your new solution. So uh, in terms of your, your speed and confidence to change, um, the vendor and their kind of hygiene and practice should give you confidence to deploy a change, but it's ultimately your responsibility to understand and uh, have clarity around how this thing is working. Um, and so that's where when we shift from people doing the doing to systems doing the doing, um, the, the people who were previously the capability of, of um, uh, processing, for example, um, ideally, uh, them or some of them would be transitioning into a uh, capability that is much more maintaining the knowledge of the doing. If you don't maintain the knowledge of the doing, uh, you end up spending, repeatedly spending money on, on current state analysis. But as you move more and more into technology systems where the majority of things are automated, um, maintaining that information becomes uh, a job in its own right or it becomes a roadblock that actually gets in the way of your ability to change confidently and quickly. So, so while we've called out here that um, speed to deliver change, ease and confidence to adapt um, should absolutely be things that your vendor supports you with, with um, whatever technology solution they've come in with. Um, ultimately, the ability for your business to understand and be confident to change will rely on you knowing the doing. Uh, where do you want your vendor? So um, there'll be a couple of terms I'm about to share that'll be quite familiar for most of you, um, but I think it's it's worth getting really clear on on these positions because um, this this goes a little way towards answering how how much time do you spend on getting ready. Um, some of the it depends can be understood in this context. So if you're going out to market because um, you know you've got a challenging environment, um, and you know that you need to. You know that you need to change, and you're looking for help to understand how to change. Then you're looking for someone who can come in and work with you to identify and design a future state for your business. Um, there are there are lots of projects that um, lots of uh, market engagement that isn't overt about this. Um, uh, they, they go to market and they're looking for someone to help them because they want to introduce an ERP or a CRM or you know some new digital um, capability. Um, and the background work in the business to kind of design its future state hasn't really happened. Um, what has happened is there's an articulation of vision, mission, outcome, but not actually 
future state business. And so I, I just made reference before around from, you know, people moving from doing the doing to knowing the doing. That's a people capability. Um, if you're moving into a digitized environment, you probably want to increase um, at least either increase or improve the maturity of that capability. Um, so that that capability and a, a change or an introduction of it becomes part of your future state business design. This is what's your what does your business look like and how does it work and who does what um, after you've actually transitioned. So um, having a vendor come in with you, they may be bringing in their technology solution, um, but if you want their help to understand all the different capabilities, then you want to make sure that when they come in, they don't come in with their dev teams. They come in first to help you do this design focus work. Um, and that also lends itself to being uh, a little bit more clear in the, in the journey to onboarding different teams. Um, now, if you're looking for a, um, a partner who's going to help you with business integration. So that's, uh, I just talked about kind of designing the future state of your business. The integration is actually standing up those capabilities. So um, if you're wanting a, a partner to help you with business integration, then the kind of things that that might include that you should be really um, deliberate about talking through your engagement with are, you know, we know we're going to need to introduce capability X. So maybe capability X is um, modern integrated knowledge management practice. Maybe maybe that's something that's, that's part of this. Um, so your expectation would be the vendor is not only bringing in uh, people, capability, who can do that, but they're going to do it in such a way that they can grow your own people so that when that partnership um, changes shape as it does when things move into kind of BAU, you've got the capability established and running in your business. So, so through whatever implementation program, you're actually also building up the people and process capability. Um, this becomes important because the last one is often what we see, where um, there are market engagement and it's positioning a partner and that partner is, is focused on um, their, their role and responsibility is system integration. So implement technology that enables us to change. Um, now, this is often uh, what we see in market engagement for software solutions. Um, the one thing to be aware of, and, and this is this is going to sound like a throwaway comment, and I don't mean it to. Um, if a partner, a vendor partner, has been engaged as the system integrator, almost anything that happens outside the boundary of that system is not their problem. They don't, they, they're not, they're not paid or engaged to do anything in that space. Um, what that means for the business who is working with a system integrator is they need to have all of the um, all of the people, process and capability for doing all of the rest of it. So the future state business design, the business integration, that is all the responsibility of the business. Um, and the system integration is the last cab off the rank. So there is generally going to be a need, if you're bringing in a vendor partner for system integration only, uh, there is generally going to be a need to stand up parallel program and project activity to identify the full range of people process and capability implications and get clear around how your business will manage those. Uh, because as I said, your system integrator partner is really going to be caring about the system that they're bringing in and, and possibly the integration points for that system, but, but not much beyond that. Um, and so if you've brought them in and they are rocking along and they're, they're turning out the, the, um, the functions and capability that you need them to, you're not going to be able to go live with those things unless you've got the, the business integration activity well understood and invested in and moving uh, to at least run in parallel, if not ahead. Um, this is, I mean, this is just a, a really simplistic view of kind of um, business enterprise, but the reason for sharing this particular view um, is when we're talking about future state business design, we're talking about that design piece. When we talk about um, the, the, um, system integration, it's generally more in that deliver space. So, so the system integration, um, looking much more at what's the capability we're building within this new um, technology environment, how are we building it? How, how are we being smart about the way the, that we are, we're building out the, the new technology? Um, and that defines space. 
Uh, this is this is the area that, in my opinion, is that defined space is not something that you should ever look to outsource. Um, this is your business. So the the knowledge, the IP of your business, the standards that you're expecting to have. So this is always an interesting discussion. Certainly it's been my experience with different, uh, working with different organizations in the past. When we talk about standards, um, there, there are all sorts of things that come up. So um, uh, people confuse standards with methodology, um, people confuse uh, standards with approaches, but actually what we're talking about here is information, the, the, the standards that are applied for documenting different information. Um, and if you have or, or follow all different practices, so if your business has standards, these should be communicated through a market engagement. If they don't have standards or are not, not agreed standards, then you want to do that before you go out to engage your market. And through the process of market engagement, uh, you, you want to be quite deliberate in making sure that where you have articulated standards, you want to be sure that your vendor is not vendor partner is not only going to not only understands that, but is going to be able to work with that. Um, and then finally, uh, that standards space is uh, when there is uh, subsequent to a market engagement, you've now got your partner on board and, and your program running. Who's actually making sure that the standards are adhered to? And so when we talk about standards, this could be anything from uh, a decision that um, BPMN, the Business Process Modeling Notation, is the standard for any process models. Um, who is actually monitoring that? Who's, who's making sure that there is compliance? Um, the reason why, um, why I'm calling this out, why I think this is an area to focus on, is because if we think about uh, the, the journey of knowledge management to date, um, go back not that long ago, and we were still talking papers, fi paper files and Iron Mountain recall kind of um, environment of managing um, uh, document management. We moved into more of an electronic document management environment um, where same kind of deal, but it's now electronic files. Um, and then there has also been the emergence of um, knowledge bases, which kind of take a lot of the information that might exist across different documents and bring it together for the purpose of service generally. Um, the next iteration of this is integrated knowledge management. And if you think that there's a term that's bandied about quite a bit, and I think it has different connotations for different people, but digital twin. So a digital twin is, is basically integrated knowledge of your business so that you have the ability to understand um, any attribute that you want to change or remove. Um, where, where is that being touched um, in any part of your process, in any part of your business? So um, what, if, what if you're talking about um, removing an attribute, what reports consume it, what processes is it part of, what rules rely on that to, <coughs> as part of, <coughs> excuse me, what rules rely on that as part of the execution of the rule? Um, so when we talk about integrated knowledge management, that's that's what we're talking about. But you can't get to integrated knowledge management if you haven't applied standards to the knowledge that is being documented. It's really important. So when you think about the things we've talked about for um, domain concept model, uh, that, that is a standard. That is a noun, verb, noun relationship, and there is a standard around how you, how you create that. Uh, for, for decision management, there are decision, there's decision modeling notation, there are Q codes and Q charts, there are different ways to model decisions for your business. Um, be clear on what standard you want to have applied. Um, the same will apply to a whole lot of other areas. And so you as a business, this is, this is your IP, this is your quality control um, position. Uh, and so getting really clear on that before you engage, overtly checking this through the engagement process and then ensuring and, and um, uh, consciously kind of uh, checking compliance to this will set your business up for moving beyond that kind of um, beyond digitization. So actually enabling, enabling you to in future um, grow your capability to have confidence, to understand impact um, and confidently and quickly change what's going on under the hood. Uh, so these standards, in my opinion, become incredibly important as we keep moving to more and more digital under the hood um, support in technology. So um, get really clear on what you want from your market engagement. We've talked about this a few times. 
Uh, but what you want from your from your vendor partner in particular, are you wanting them to help with future state business design? Are you wanting them to actually help grow your capability to manage the new product that's coming in? Or are you just wanting them to implement the new product? Um, those knowledge anchors, they reduce assumptions, they create ease for decision making. And as I just talked about, they create a foundation for you to move into, uh, along with the kind of um, document and information management evolution, to move into integrated knowledge management, um, that, that kind of digital twin environment. Um, they also make it really easy for people to engage. Uh, these things are all uh, visually, they're all generally quite visual, quite easy to consume, and they're not a massive amount of effort to put in. Uh, and then the last thing is very much around the, um, when you're going to market and that kind of vendor and partner engagement, What's your role and responsibility? So coming back to uh, what I talked about earlier, get your business domain concept models sorted. That's how you identify and clearly communicate what's unique about your business, the things that are gonna matter in terms of a, a, a market response. Um, getting really clear on, on uh, whether you're going to be holding responsibility for the future state business design, the, the um, business integration, and, and working with your partner around system integration, just getting really clear on your role and responsibility. Um, the key thing that I would leave you with in terms of your role and responsibility, really your first and foremost focus should always be on your business IP. Um, the, 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 the vendor and partner responsibility is to help you create an environment to allow your business IP to land in and to safely manage and deliver your services post change. Uh, so we talked about um, the the assessment, um, you know, do, doing a sanity check before you go to market. Uh, this is just a bit of a plug for us. We we do do this. We have done this quite a few times, and uh, the feedback we've had from different clients that we've done this with has been really positive. Uh, so do take that that short period of time to get a fresh pair of eyes. Make sure that you bring someone in who um, can be within your business. Doesn't have to be doesn't have to be a, a, an external party. But do take that small window of time and sanity check whether your um, content for market engagement is going to have um, the expected response that you want. Um, and yeah, if you want to talk to us about it, we can obviously help you with that. Uh, Amanda. Oh, and, and the final uh, unashamed plug, <laughs> uh, we we do run BA courses throughout the year and then we've got a few coming up in the, in the early in the 2024 in the new year, which is a bit scary. Uh, it's, it's a great course that covers sort of right through end to end um, for those people that may have just joined joined the BA profession without actually having any formal training, but uh, you know got that SME knowledge and things like that and want to get that formal understanding of formal training or young young BAs that are growing and evolving and wanting to move um, more into maybe the strategic area and and understand what the, the life cycle of BA. It, it covers off uh, a lot of those things. So. Um, if you've got any uh, yourself or anyone that you know, sit, let, let me know. Contact me and, and maybe we can work out a, a, a special webinar discount. Thank you, Amanda, and thank you, <laughs> Yvonne. Um, really conscious of the time. Um, and luckily, we have a great question to end with, actually, because I think it sums up the last 90 minutes. And I'll pose it to both Yvonne and Amanda. Um, what would you say are the top three must do's when developing successful RFPs? All right, so um, I think the, the top three must do's, make sure your investment stakeholders are on the same page. So that, I think that's the first must do. You, if, if there is any doubt that there might be a difference of opinion, um, surface that. So, so get your investment stakeholders, your business investment stakeholders uh, to agree the page that they're on. Um, it'll make your life a whole lot easier, both going through the process and, and beyond. Um, uh, the, the next thing would be um, taking the, um, the, the domain concept models, doing, doing, that, doing that piece of work, because that will very quickly highlight the unique attributes of your business that the market needs to understand. Um, it's um, this, this, keep in mind, this is over and above kind of setting out um, the story around where you're trying to go. This is, um, this is beyond the story of where you're trying to go and actually very, very clearly who or what are you and what matters in that, in that, in that context. So, so those would be the first two things. 
Um, and then the third thing uh, that I would be suggesting is um, once again, from your business perspective, um, being very, very clear around how uh, around your role and responsibility in whatever partnership you end up in and making sure that you have um, created visibility of the work that you are going to need to do as part of that responsibility. So alongside um, project work that might be being stood up for the vendor to come in and start doing their thing, um, just being really, really clear that you've got the direction for creating the, 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 the business IP um, to support whatever changes is coming. Thank you, Yvonne. Amanda? Um, I think uh, uh, it's Yvonne stole my thunder. I think it's pretty much the same as Yvonne. One thing I'd add um, in there is, you know, when you're writing these RFPs or creating them, um, make them transparent. Like, give the vendors the answers. Like, make sure, that, you know, you're not... Um, hiding anything or being tricky about things i think sometimes we feel like we shouldn't be that clear because they're just going to tell us what we want but exactly that is what we want we want them to tell us what we want and we want to make it and we do this in in the testing world as well isn't it it's actually test driven development is you're giving the test to the developers so they build what we want to test this is the same thing we want to tell them the, in very clear words what we want and what success for us so they can come back and provide us with or ask the right questions and answer what we need so clarity transparency and don't hide things that don't be tricky sorry that, 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 that's great um well it's 10 31 um so i think we'll call it to an end i'd like to thank um, amanda and yvonne for sharing their their knowledge um their expertise and uh, doing it enthusiastically <laughs> uh, and holding our attention for, uh, for the last hour and a half, which is fantastic. The slides will be um, available, as will the recording. I think we just need to uh, just edit it. Um, definitely take my dog out of one of the shots at one stage, mm -hmm. uh, which would be fantastic. Um, but please, if you have any other questions, um, you can use uh, Slido to put them down there. We will, uh, we will get around. We will answer them, and we will get back to you. Um, so that's it from me. Um, Cass, would you like to say anything before we leave? No, I think it's been a great session. Thank you so much, Steve, for hosting, um, uh, being the MC, and to Yvonne and Amanda. I think I echo what um, Desiree mentioned. Thank you so much for um, a great presentation and sharing your knowledge. Yeah. Thank yeah. you, everybody, for coming along. It was great to, to see, your, see your names. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I'm um, sorry. I do have one more um, thing to mention. Uh, there will be a post event, a post webinar survey that we'll be sending out. It's just three questions, um, and most importantly, helping us to actually uh, understand some of the um, future topics that we can actually discuss um, during such sessions. So we we'll, we'll appreciate if you can take just take two minutes of your time to do that. Brilliant. Uh, and on that note, we'll say goodbye. Thank you. Bye.